Hi, this is Sonia from An Enthusiastic Reader. I haven't made a video in about a month wrapping up what I've read, so I thought today would be a great day to do a Friday Reads and catch you up on some of the great books I've read between a month ago and now. Okay, the first book I want to talk about is a reread of Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen. I've read this book numerous times in the past, over the past, you know, 25 years, and I felt because I listened to the audiobook this time, narrated by Rosamund Pike, that I really had to take time to listen to all of it. And sometimes when I reread something, I don't know if you do this, but my eyes will kind of skip ahead to where I'm really looking for the meat of whatever was happening in the scene, not really letting every single sentence kind of sink in. And this time, because I was listening to it while I was walking in the mornings, I really felt like I got and absorbed the story more and understood that it was a setup from the very beginning. The plotting was so intricate that, you know, she laid out the logic of the plot at the, from the very beginning and seeing how silly the father was and, and really how desperate uh, Mrs. Bennett was to get her daughters married because there wasn't anything there to support them. I mean, they would be at the mercy of family to take care of them once uh, Mr. Bennett died. So even though she was frivolous and, and tiresome and bore, uh, pedantic, you do really have to kind of care about her and her worries for her offspring because she only had daughters and they would not be getting the estate. So I really enjoyed it. I'm so glad that I listened to it. I read the first book in the Inspector Lindley series called A Great Deliverance by Elizabeth George. And I'm so conflicted about this book because I really do like the premise of this aristocratic detective and he's got a pretty troubled past um so he's an interesting character and there is another side character that's going to be his partner and she has got a lot of problems too and where my conflict for this book came is that the treatment and depiction of women and hysteria and their psychoses and pathologies are so dated and very confusing that this woman wrote about these characters with such a disdain for women, it felt. And I'm, I've heard such great things about the series, so I'm kind of waiting to see if, you know, something that was written in the 1980s develops, and she's still writing novels in this series now, like, do these characters develop and does the understanding of how women think and how they function in society change over the course of the series? So. I'm going to give it a couple more books and see what happens because I do like the writing and I do like the intricacy of the plot and the characters, but I'm concerned about how women come across. I'm really excited to tell you about this next book that I read. It's by Ernest Gaines and Ernest Gaines was born on a plantation. He was born in the 1930s, a fifth generation of a sharecropping family. So he was born and raised in Louisiana on a plantation and lived in the slave quarters. And he has written a whole bunch of novels. And the novel I want to tell you about is the autobiography of Miss Jane Pittman. And this story is based a little bit on his aunt who took care of them when, and raised a whole bunch of children on, on this plantation. And apparently she was disabled and did not have um, the function of her legs or her, they were even missing. And she was able to raise all these children and she was this strong, incredible woman in his life and influence. And she apparently influenced the character of Miss Jane Pittman. The book was written in 1971 and it takes place from emancipation all the way through the civil rights movement. And you see her character aging. The setup of the novel is that uh, an academic is interviewing her I think he's a documentarian. He's interviewing her for his documentary. And so he has this little tiny appearance at the very beginning of the text, and then you never hear or see from him again. The entire rest of the story comes from Jane herself. And on top of seeing her story and where she ends up after emancipation and all of the situations in her life, she also tells stories of all the people around her. So there's like a network of plantations 
she never ends up leaving Louisiana, even though she really wants to go to o Ohio. She's like a 12 year old girl when she's emancipated and she is just wanting to go to o Ohio for some reason so badly because uh, one of the Yankee soldiers who came through right before emancipation happened told her to look him up in Ohio. And so that is her driving force at the beginning. But then you get to see how that, that really doesn't work out and the whole rest of her life unfolds. There's um, a lot of black history interwoven into the story. For instance, the philosophical differences between Frederick Douglass and Booker T. Washington should black people after emancipation be a part of society or should they be separate from society but still allowed to succeed? And so things like that. If you had a book club that wanted to know more about the way that uh, the history of America unfolded after emancipation, both black and white. This would be an excellent book. And on top of all of that, she's just a really vibrant, funny, feisty, and very smart person. And she understands human behavior. She understands the motivations of people around her. She knows, um, she just knows what's happening and she's not confused about it in any way and she has to figure out ways to live around the suppression of whites in her society and get around it and figure out ways to navigate all of the obstacles that are put in her way. So I love this book. I listened to the audiobook narrated by Lynn Thigpen who has sadly uh, died, but she narrated a whole bunch of African-American uh, audiobooks. So she did the entire Toni Morrison series, and those books have all been pulled out of circulation because then Toni Morrison recorded her own books. But if you could ever get a hold of a Lynn Thigpen narrated novel, I think you would be in for a huge treat. So uh, this was a five-star book for me, and I think uh, it has a lot to offer in terms of just a very simply told story of very intricate and complicated people. The next audiobook I listened to was In the Dream House by Carmen Maria Machado. I'm so glad this book got published. It's really important to normalize stories of relationships between all kinds of people and all orientations and all genders, and it's important to do that. So the story is I mean, it's a memoir and it's written in a very unconventional style in snippets like that is one of her hallmark ways of writing stories and, and memoir. And it's the story of an abusive relationship, a girlfriend that she had that was really very counterproductive and destructive to Carmen's psyche. And I think it's really important to say, you know, I believe that she felt incredible pain, and I do not want to discount that. Um, I had some trouble with the writing itself. I thought it was a little bit overwritten. I felt like some of the metaphors and were forced and a little bit ham-fisted. I think she was trying too hard in certain parts to craft something out of her story. So... If I were her editor, I probably would have convinced her to pair back on a little bit of that. However, I think it's an important story. I know and, and sympathize with her pain, and I feel like I really understood where she was coming from, trying to figure out her life out inside and outside of this very toxic relationship. So um, I gave it three and a half stars, but I'm glad that she... I'm glad we're publishing all kinds of different stories. Okay, the next book uh, is A Single Thread by Tracy Chevalier. This is the story of a single woman between the wars in England. She has a very unhappy mother who is a widow, and she breaks away from living with her mother and, and forges her own life, and that's really what this story is about. She moves to Winchester, and she's a secretary, but she becomes a volunteer embroiderer. That's a really hard word to say. I'm not going to say it again, but she learns to embroidery um, cushion, seat cushions and 
um, she creates this entire circle of friends and see, starts to see beyond the scope of how she was raised in, and broadening her society. And she also falls in love with someone for a time and tries to get over the grief of losing her father and brother and her fiance in World War I. So there's a lot to it, but it's really, it's like a middle-aged, because she's almost middle-aged, coming-of-age story. Um, her breaking out of all the patterns that she was raised with. Um, it's a conventional novel, It's, but I thought it was really tender and I really enjoyed getting to know this character from the inside out through this short period of time in her life. So I, th I thought it was really successful and I enjoyed it a lot. I'm also very excited to tell you that I read David Mitchell's new novel called Utopia Avenue. It's coming out very soon, I think next week. And I loved it. I was very, I could not wait to get back to it. It's a very um, Mitchell-esque novel. And if you've read David Mitchell, you know what I'm talking about. It is the story of four young musicians who are brought together by a manager to form a psychedelic band in London in 1968. So you've got um, mentions of the Vietnam War and the protests that happened in London. You've got how the band comes together and what happens to the band as a whole through over time. And then you get the backstories of each individual band member and the band manager. So you deeply get to know these five characters uh, and their stories. And David Mitchell always introduces characters from previous novels, and that is very true in this book as well. So if you, I would say you would enjoy the book more if you've read The Thousand Autumns of Jacob de Zut and the Bone Clocks, because the things that happened in the Bone Clocks, if you remember what happened in that book, um, is par definitely par one part of this novel. It's not the entire novel, but it is one part, and it might be easier to understand if you remember that part. I wouldn't say you need to go out and reread the Bone Clocks. I think if you have an, a pretty good memory of what happened in that book, you will get the gist, but Mitchell very um, succinctly captures the spirit of 1968 um, and all of the other musicians that were real bands at the time encounter this band. So if you are a person who doesn't really like it when real life characters intrude upon a novel, you might not like this and not everyone will, but I thought it was kind of important if you're going to write a, band, a book about a fictional band that was alive during this time. I mean, you have to talk about the bands that would have influenced their music too, and talked about the just the spirit of that particular summer and what was happening in the world. Um, and so it's interesting because as a family, over the last few weeks, we were watching the entire Ken Burns Vietnam War documentary, and it seems like every single thing I read or encounter on television right now talks about the Vietnam War. And I don't know if I'm just more attuned to it because we spent like 18 hours learning about the war, but that was a great documentary series. So if you're looking for something that you could watch like one episode a night for a few nights just to kind of get out of your own head, I would highly recommend that. The last novel I want to talk about isn't coming out till October. It was supposed to come out this summer and apparently they pushed the publication back, but it is called uh, Leave the World Behind by um, Ruman Alam. And he is a novelist that has a very particular style and this novel is, okay, it starts out and you're, it almost feels like satire because it's a family of four. They're going to their dream vacation. They really can't necessarily afford it, but they are throwing all care to the wind and go and renting someone's house in Long Island for a week. And they're really planning on living it up. And the characters seem almost superficial the way that they're described in the first 20% of the book. So I implore you that I think Ramon, uh, Ramon Alam is one of the kinds of authors where you can't just bail on the book right at the beginning if you want to get the whole full flavor of it because he's kind of tricking you a little bit at the beginning. Um, so this family gets to Long Island. They start living their dream vacation. They're very hung up on just the brands of things that they've purchased, the kinds of food they're eating, 
how they're spending their days. And then they get a knock on the door and this is where the world changes. And it's the owners of the vacation house. And these are like late middle-aged people in their 60s who are wealthy and they own this vacation home. And they find out that the grid has gone down in New York City. And when they find that out, they feel like they need the protection of their vacation home to you know, figure out what's going on. Although they've rented it out to this family for a week and it's unclear if the family will let them stay. And from there on, uh, things change drastically in their lives. I mean, it's like they are the only characters basically in the book. So you're, you're getting little snips snippets from the narrator about what might be happening outside, but really like no clear picture. And so you are just as disoriented as the characters that are in this house together, trying to figure out how to proceed in a world that's turned upside down. So it's pretty prescient. Um, I think it's interesting because I saw Alam tweet the other day that he's not at all worried that a very, very famous author is also coming out with a book about the grid going down in the same month that he's publishing this book. And the the book happens to be by Don DeLillo, and apparently he's written a novel about the grid going down. So I hope that people will read this book as well as the DeLillo if it comes out, when it comes out, and and try to understand that I guess a lot of authors a couple of years ago were feeling quite an anxiety about what would happen if our whole world got turned upside down and now we're seeing how it plays out in real life and in the fictional lives of their of the author's heads so um it was a lot to take on it doesn't make you feel settled and um but I would highly recommend it so if you get a chance to read it when it comes out in October um you might like it don't bail on it till you get to 40%, okay? I am currently reading a book called Want by Lynn Steger Strong. It's a novel about a woman who is, she at the very beginning of the book, she and her husband are declaring bankruptcy. So it's a lot about uh, financial instability and the corporatization of, she's a school teacher and all of the constrictors put upon them with a, like a corporate mentality, plus grappling a lot with a failed relationship from her teenage years and some very dark uh, relationships that she has with her parents who are, it's a highly toxic relationship that is influencing what's happening to her in her life now. So I'm really, I don't want to say enjoying it, but I can't wait to get back to it. The writing is very strong. The character is, and like you're deeply in the head of this character. So that's what I have to say. That's what I've been reading. What have you been reading? I hope you're all doing well. I haven't been a great booktuber lately. I have watched more videos than I've commented on. So I am still watching, but I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but you get very tired of seeing your own comments, like what you're saying. So um, I don't know how you deal with that, but right now I'm just kind of tired of myself. And so I haven't been commenting, but I have been watching. There's so many videos out there right now. In there, and I hope to do another video soon. Uh, I know I have some tags out there and I need to get busy. So have a good week and I will get back to you soon. Bye.